Welcome to worship. My name is Kim Beery, and I am the associate pastor here at Trinity United Methodist Church. We have a few ministries you may be interested in, which includes our greeting card ministry. You can call the church office to get a name of someone who's on our shut-in list. Then throughout the year, you can send them encouraging cards and brighten their world. Next Sunday, January 17th, we will celebrate Holy Communion. And you'll be encouraged to gather your communion elements at home and be ready for this sacred time together. Also, we will be starting our new sermon series, uh, which begins with the sermon, I'm happy like a room without a roof. So get ready for this exciting sermon series. Then on January 17th, you can give a special offering for our Human Relations Day. This special fund supports ministries of social justice and outreach. So please choose to give generously and thank you very much. Today we will be celebrating our baptismal renewal time together. So I encourage you to go around the house and maybe get a bowl of water or a cup of water that will represent the waters of baptism. Come, let us worship God, the Prince of Peace. Will you join us for the call to worship? My God, my God, why have you forsaken us? Darkness has spread across the land, and chaos reigns. My God, we cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no peace. The Lord will never forsake you. Remember and recite the words Jesus said to his followers. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid.
I am leaving you with a gift, a gift of peace of mind and heart. You know, Jesus said that in the book of John. Listen to this one. The mountains may shift, the hills may be shaken, but my faithful love won't shift from you, and my covenant of peace won't be shaken. That's from Isaiah. God isn't a God of disorder, but of peace. The peace of Christ must control your hearts. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Those are all scriptures from the Bible that talk about peace. Did you know that the word peace actually appears in the Bible over 420 times? And we even call Jesus the Prince of Peace. You know, sometimes we might think that we need to do really big things to make the world more peaceful. And I think that a lot of you will do that in your lifetime. But peace really has to start in our own heart first. So let's talk about how we can do that. So when you feel anger or frustration or just plain mad, you must first be still. Take deep breaths, calm yourself, and ask God to help you. It's okay to be angry, but we have to learn how to settle ourselves down so that we can speak clearly and actually get problems solved. So let's try it right now. All right, I want you to imagine a time when you were really, really mad. I mean, clench your fists, scowl, look angry. And now, stop. Close your eyes, be still, relax your body, and just breathe. You know, you can also bring peace to your families. I might be going out on a limb here, but I bet that the adults in your life have been pretty stressed out this year, and you guys probably have too. Well, I hope that we can even be peacemakers in our own families. So let's practice that right now. Okay, no matter how you're feeling towards the people in your house, I want you to get up and go give them a hug or maybe just a high five. No, really, I want you to go do that right now. Go give someone a hug. Okay, and if you're watching this by yourself, I hope that after you're done worshiping, that you'll go give a friend or a family member a call and practice being a peacemaker. You know, God will probably put it on your heart just exactly who needs to hear from you. Would you pray with me? God, we know that peace is important to you. Help us to find peace in our hearts, in our families, and in our world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we approach our time of prayer, let us remember that Jesus told his disciples that when two or more are gathered in his name, there he would be in the midst, in the middle of them. I don't know about you, but I sure need Jesus in the middle right now. This week, many of us watched in horror as a mob sieged the White House, our symbol of democracy, unity, and justice based on the law. As a Christian, I went through many emotions as I watched the chaos and violence unfold. I experienced fear, anger, disbelief, and much more. And so I challenged myself, and today I continue to challenge us to pray through our emotions as we refocus on the basic foundations of our freedoms, liberty, and justice for all. So I would like for us to just take a moment, breathe out the frustration, be calm like Carrie told us, and prepare ourselves for prayer.
God of all life. We gather in the power of your presence, standing with those who have gone before us, men and women who have showed courage and strength in the face of opposition. May we lift up our governmental leaders in prayer, that they will be filled with wisdom and strength to lead our country into the future where voices can be heard without destruction and violence. In this chaotic time, Lord, give us your peace, the peace that does not depend on our circumstances, but upon your presence. You are faithful and you will help us as we strive for peace in the United States and within ourselves. Help us wrestle individually and corporately with our own tendency to sin as we examine the evil within ourselves. Teach us to remove the beam out of our own eye before we go looking for the speck of our neighbor. Help us see clearly. Strengthen us, God, to be strong and courageous and to not fear because you go with us. You will never leave or abandon us. Lord, keep us centered in the faith promises as we share the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I encourage you to think about the words that are shared during the baptismal vows. Maybe you don't remember them. Maybe that was years ago. Maybe you're pondering what all this means. Maybe you're just starting your own spiritual journey and you have some questions about baptism. Please call Pastor Michael or me and we'll, we'll talk with you about your spiritual walk. As we go through this liturgy together, I encourage you to follow Randy with your responses. Sisters and brothers in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, God's spirit has been poured out upon the water, water poured over and immersing us, water that flows freely for all who will receive it. Water from the streams of God's saving power and justice. Water that brings hope to all who thirst for righteousness. Water that refreshes life, nurtures growth, and offers new birth. Today, we come to the waters to renew our commitment to Christ who has raised us, the spirit who has birthed us, and the creator who is making all things new. And so I ask you, will you turn away from the powers of sin and death? We renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of our sin. Will you let the Spirit use you as prophets to the powers that be? We accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Will you proclaim the good news and live as disciples of Jesus Christ, his body on earth? We confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, put our whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him in our, as our Lord in union with the church 
which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Will you be living witnesses to the gospel individually and together, wherever you are and in all that you do? We will remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world. Will you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? We affirm and teach the faith of the whole church as we put our trust in God, the Father Almighty, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Will you join us as we bless the water? Put your hands over your water at home, or you may even want to put your palms up. And uh, a little bit later, we will be making a commitment um, with our hands and our touch with this holy water. Come upon us, Holy Spirit. Come upon us, Holy Spirit. Come upon these waters. Come upon these waters. Let these waters be to us drops of your mercy. Let these waters remind us of your righteousness and justice. Let these waters renew in us the resurrection power of Jesus. All glory is yours now and forever. Amen. I encourage you to make a sign of the cross on your forehead or touch the water to your heart or your face and remember the cleansing waters of God's grace and know that you are beloved and God is with you. Please say that I remember that I'm baptized and rejoice. Our time of offering is an opportunity for us to be instruments of God's peace through our generosity and gifts. There are three ways that you can give to the church and the ministries here at Trinity. You can send a check through the mail to 1602 North Main Street here in Hutchinson, Kansas, 67501. Or you may want to give online by going to www.trinityhutch.org or perhaps you would like to give through Vimno at trinityumc-hutch. May our tithes and offering be an act of worship as we join God's transforming work. Let your giving be a blessing.
Our scripture for today comes from the second chapter of Luke, verses 8 through 14. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today is the second Sunday of January. The new year is just beginning to unfold. We're still basking in the glow of our glorious Christmas celebration. When we remember the angel's proclamation to the shepherds, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born on this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Peace on earth. We were promised peace on earth. And the prophet Isaiah foretold that the birth of the Messiah would usher in the kingdom of God. For a child has been born for us a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulder, and he, he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom, he will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forevermore. Peace. Justice, righteousness. Where is it? When will there be peace on earth? Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this is not the sermon I was planning to preach today. The Holy Spirit compelled me to address the tragic events in our nation's capital this past week. In times of crisis, my role as a spiritual leader is to name the truth as I understand it. It would be a failure of my ordination vows to do otherwise. We need to name what happened so that we can process this traumatic experience and we can formulate a faithful response. In our baptismal vows, which Pastor Kim renewed today, we all promise to resist evil and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. In order to resist evil, we must name it. Make no mistake, what we witnessed was the result of human sin and evil. We must not downplay it, say it wasn't that bad. We shouldn't justify it. We shouldn't make excuses for it. Evil flourishes when we lack the courage to face the truth, no matter how uncomfortable or painful it is. So here's what happened. For the first time in our country's history, the nation's capital was attacked by U.S. citizens. On January 6, 2021, a violent mob stormed the Capitol building while members of Congress were fulfilling their constitutional duty to count the electoral college votes and certify the winner of the presidential election. The Capitol Police were clearly unprepared 
outnumbered and overwhelmed by the angry crowd. Members of Congress and their staffs ran for their lives and hid while the terrorists desecrated the symbol of democracy. You know, I did a little research and I was surprised that they started building the Capitol building in 1793. It's over 200 years old, the symbol of democracy. They were smashing the windows, breaking down the doors, running through the halls, urinating in offices, infiltrating the Senate chamber and sitting in the dais, destroying property and stealing property. Some of the terrorists even brought weapons and bombs and the extent to which we found out later was very serious. Over 50 police officers were injured and had to go to the hospital. Five people died. One of those police officers was murdered with a fire extinguisher. It could have been so much worse. So serious. The goal of the terrorists was to disrupt the work of the Congress and overturn the election by force. That is the very definition of insurrection. As I watched the disturbing images of the riot in D.C. on Wednesday afternoon, I felt shocked and scared and angry and a deep sense of sadness. I mean, it was just heartbreaking. Pastor Kim, in her pastoral prayer, also named these feelings that many of us felt this week and our need to take them to the Lord in prayer. We've been through a shared traumatic experience, reminiscent of the attack on 9-11. The country we love has been wounded, and we are all in need of healing. I am deeply concerned about this attack on our democracy, and I am certain that you join me in condemning the violence, the destruction of property, the endangerment of human life. Law and order is the foundation of any civilized nation, and there should be consequences for these crimes. The people who perpetrated these treasonous acts should be punished to the full extent of the law. The day of the siege on the Capitol, President Trump spoke to his supporters in front of the White House at the rally to save America. I watched his speech. President Trump told his supporters that he would never concede the election and he would keep fighting. President Trump told his supporters to march down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol building to show strength, to fight like hell, and to take back the country. Words have power. Words matter. And the truth is, President Trump's words incited an insurrection. That is the judgment, not only of me, but of many key Republican leaders and in members of his own administration who denounced the president, including Attorney General Bill Barr, a staunch supporter of the president who stated this, orchestrating a mob to pressure Congress is inexcusable. The president's conduct yesterday was a betrayal of his office and supporters. The truth is too important to simply ignore it or to deny it. What a sad day for the rule of law, a sad day for democracy, a sad day for our country. As followers of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace we are called to resist acts of violence and hate. But we cannot defeat hate with more hate. Jesus taught us a better way to live. We are called to respond to hate with love. That is the meaning of the cross. Jesus endured the hate and the sin and the evil of the world. He suffered and died on the cross. And it looked like evil had won. But then Jesus rose from the grave, he triumphed, he overcame sin and death, and he redeemed the world through his sacrificial love. It's the whole point of our faith. And the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, it was the beginning of ushering in the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God has not yet come to its fullness. Jesus sowed the seeds of peace that we are now called to cultivate and to gather the harvest for the kingdom. We have work to do. As it's written in 2 Corinthians, 
All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has now given us the ministry of reconciliation. Do you hear that? The responsibility has been given to us. We are called to reconcile the world. He goes on to call us ambassadors for Christ. And also Jesus taught, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. We are called to be peacemakers, to make peace. And so there will be peace on earth when we repent, first of all. Literally, to repent means to change your mind, to change your ways. You and I must repent of our sins that have contributed to this problem. I'm speaking of myself as well. We need to repent of the sins of self-centeredness, apathy, prejudice, idolatry of any political party or politician, self-awareness makes peace. There will be peace on earth when the scales are removed from our eyes by the power of the Holy Spirit and we're able to perceive what is true. Just like Saul, who persecuted Christians because he was so certain in his opinion that they were evil. On the road to Damascus, God struck Saul down blinded him, and made him see the errors of his way. God gave him a new perspective, a new mission, and a new name, Paul. Knowing the truth makes peace. There will be peace on earth when we recognize the sacred value of every person as a child of God, when we understand that our lives are all interconnected and a threat to the dignity and freedom of any person is a threat to all of us. Respect makes peace. And there will be peace on earth when we take the first steps to reconcile with those whom we have hurt or who have hurt us. Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Forgiveness makes peace. And there will be peace on earth when we actively dismantle the walls of systemic racism brick by brick and let justice flow down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And there will be peace on earth when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.